Thanks for staying with us. It's time now to review the papers and see what made it to the headlines or made it to the front pages of our newspapers. Uh, so we have joining us this morning to discuss this, uh, Mr. Jide Johnson, a public affairs analyst. Good morning and welcome to the program, sir. We also have Mr. Nick Agule joining us from uh, Dallas. He's also a public affairs analyst. Good morning and welcome to the program. Good morning, and good morning to our viewers. Okay. Well, the headlines today are mostly on the protests, so let's just shelf that for a, a bit and then look at other issues that may not be related before we go back to the protests, because everything spoken about the protests is related. Um, let's see, first of all, Dangote refinery to gulp 1.7 trillion uh, Naira crude monthly. That's according to report. Let me come to you, Mr. Nika Gule, as an expert in that field. Um, so this is what is going to happen. But generally about the Dangote refinery, knowing what kind, what amount of crude will be going to Dangote and the fact that it's going to be sourcing uh, the more than more than 70 percent of this crude from outside the shores of Nigeria, will it have a significant impact on our economy? I uh, thank you very much uh, for the question. As regards the Dangote refinery issue, together with Mr. President's latest directive, I think Mr. President might end up being disappointed in the same way that uh, he ordered for the grant reserves to be released to Nigerians only for him to discover that the grace reserves are empty. Uh, they could be, they, it's possible that on paper, the civil servants were reporting that we had enough grace, but in reality, the grace were not there. And that is what is looking to be the case with Dangote family as regards the issuance of crude oil to them. Because uh, Nigeria is producing 1.2 million to 1.4 million barrels per day. Uh, 650,000 barrels that Dangote refinery needs is about 50% of that production. And I can assure you that nobody produces crude oil and keeps it waiting for the market. Crude oil has already been committed ahead of time by the owners of the crude oil, who are principally the government of Nigeria, the international oil companies, and the indigenous uh, operators. They've committed their crude oil ahead of time. So I can't possibly see where we are going to see 650,000 barrels to be given to Dangote refinery every day. And my advice to Dangote is exactly what you have said. Dangote refinery needs to look further afield around the world to source their crude oil. Singapore has no crude oil, but they have a refining capacity of 1.5 million barrels per day, meaning Singapore buys all of its 1.5 million barrels per day crude oil needs from the international market. Now, if Dangote refinery sources for crude from the international market, I don't think anything changes about their business plan. Uh, they, they refine the crude oil, and then they have the Nigerian market to supply to, they have the international market to supply to. As a business, they supply the crude oil to the market that is going to give them a profit. And if that market is in Nigerian market, fine, they supply to the Nigerian market. If that market is the international market, they will supply to the international market. If the price at which they are landing their petroleum products in the Nigeria market is more than what the federal government thinks Nigeria should be buying petrol for, the federal government can continue their subsidy scheme, even though they deny they are not subsidizing crude oil, I mean petroleum products. We know that they are subsidizing PMS. Uh, because if they are not subsidizing PMS, the price of PMS can never be stable in Nigeria the way it is why the international market for crude oil has been jumping up and down. So if Nigeria decides to subsidize a Dangote refineries products and pushes them into the market, it's even better than subsidizing products coming from a foreign refinery. Because the Dangote refinery will be recruiting Nigerians, paying taxes to the Nigerian economy, generally adding value to the Nigerian economy, as in, as in comparison to a refinery in Singapore, that we are subsidizing the, their, their products and they are adding nothing to the Nigerian economy. So that will be my view on the Dangote refinery uh, issue. 
Yeah, uh, but you know that the 650 uh, barrels will not be given to Dangote alone. We've, we've been told that it will be, it's going to be 400 and something, maybe 450 or so, that will be given to all the refineries in Nigeria, including the modular refineries that are already operating and that may be operating afterwards. In fact, including the NNPC uh, refineries in Portakot, Wari, and Kaduna or so. So it is not all that that will be given to Dangote, unfortunately. What, a, what he will be sourcing for will be more than 75% from outside the shores of Nigeria. The only good thing is that he's going to be buying the crude from Nigeria in Naira, which means the pressure of the dollar or of him sourcing for the dollar to buy the crude will not be there anymore. That's what I see. But let me go to... Yeah, but, that, but, 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 but that's where the issue is. If it is just 400 and something thousand barrels per day that are being offered to Dangote... To everybody, not just Dangote. Not just Dangote, yeah. to all the refineries. Not just Dangote. Exactly. And all the other refineries in Nigeria, the NNPC refineries alone, if they come on stream, all of them, they need 425,000 barrels per day. 425,000 barrels per day. Water Smith and the other ones, they, they are small refineries, maybe 5,000, 10,000 barrels. But if it's 400,000 barrels and NNPC Portacot, the, the, the smaller refinery, comes on stream, that is 60,000 barrels. The bigger refinery in Portaco comes on stream, it's 150,000 barrels. So by the time you put in Kaduna and Wari, it's 424,000 barrels. So where would they now see uh, crude oil to give to Dangote refinery? I think Dangote refinery should just think about going anywhere in the world and sourcing their crude. And also Dangote refinery needs to put their ears to the ground and watch out for when IOCs are exiting oil blocks in Nigeria. They should invest into it. If Dangote refinery has its own uh, oil producing fields, and then they are producing their crude oil and then supply to their refinery. It will add them a much value than what they're doing now. That's what the IOCs do. The IOCs come to Nigeria, produce crude oil, take it to their refinery somewhere in the world, and they, they, they continue to add value to their business. Okay. Well, Mr. Johnson, uh, let's take a different headline here. Um, it's about loans. It's on the punch and it's also on uh, the Daily Trust. Uh, AFDB okays 750 billion Naira loan for Nigeria's energy tran transition program. Another loan. So, what are your thoughts? Well, um, it's, 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 very, it's interesting in the sense that um, it's related to the first issue raised, which, are, which is about energy. Mm. And I'm sure this is about green energy and renewable energy. That's why we are getting this loan. The one we are blessed with naturally, we have not been able to manage it. Now we want to get a loan on renewable energy. Um, as far as I'm concerned, this is just providing money, money for the boys. Because all the loans we have collected in the last, in the last, let me be modest, in the last, in the last, um, in the last ten years, what have we done with the loan? It seems as if the last two administration. Um, is much more interested in collecting loan, loan that are not accountable for loan that are not transparent, loan that are not actually invested in what they are sourced for. So, as far as this issue is concerned, we just hear about getting the loan. We won't hear anything about the disbursement of the loan and how this loan are utilized for the purposes for which they, 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 they are sourced for in the, in the in the first in the first instance. Uh, we, are, we are still battling with, 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 with how to manage the fossil fuel in Nigeria, that sector, that energy sector, the crude oil sector, and yet we are looking for loan. Look at what was said in the first issue. We are all in Nigeria, yet companies that have been investing in this particular sector could not even have access to the raw material in which they need to to. to, to Okay, we've been talking with Mr. Johnson and uh, Nika Gule. We are still on the papers uh, this morning. As, as we wait to, uh, to get the audio of Mr. Johnson fixed, let's go to other issues uh, that are being uh, discussed here on uh, the headlines or on the newspapers. Um, FCE Governing Council removes provost appoints replacement is a headline here. 
uh, but we're going to something else. Business sh businesses shot in many states. Uh, that's uh, another headline on the Daily Trust. And then we have cost of healthy diet rises by 45% in six months. Healthy diet, cost of healthy diet rises in 40 to f by 45% in six months. Okay, so we are... All, everything now that we're going to be discussing will be more or less related to the, the uh, protest that is happening. Without singling out any of these uh, headlines to bring, because every newspaper that we are treating today has this, Vanguard, The Guardian, Daily Trust, Punch, you take your pick. Um, Mr. Agule, uh, tell us your thoughts about the protest and what has been happening. So, protest is a constitutional right of citizens of a democracy. And if we are practicing democracy, we have to make it possible for citizens to vent their grievances or anger in protest, peaceful protest, lawful assembly, the right to free speech and right to, uh, to free assembly are guaranteed by our constitution. They are also part of human rights. So what is expected of the government is to create the enabling environment for citizens to protest, for citizens to be able to exercise their constitutional right to make their voices heard. But in Nigeria, the reverse seems to be the case. The government is unable to provide security for the people. And we see cases of kidnapping and all sorts of uh, criminality going on around the people. The government doesn't mobilize security to come out. But when the citizens want to protest, that is when the government mobilizes security to come out. The level of security that has been mobilized, look, I saw a video in the Lekki Axis in Lagos that was purported to be, you know, shot uh, in preparation for this protest. There were like a hundred security vehicles on, on patrol, you know, trying to stop citizens from protesting. Why were those vehicles not lined up to protect citizens who have been taken for game by kidnappers, bandits, and robbers, all sorts of people around the country? So the Nigerian government is failing in its own constitutional duties of providing a safe uh, a playing ground for citizens to protest. Instead, you hear threats from government. The other, at the other time, I, I was hearing about uh, Asari Dokubo. This is a man who protested with arms. He used arms in the, in the Niger Delta to protest. A man that he is having whatever links he has with the current government he is not threatening those who want to protest peacefully, not to come out. So I think if we want to practice democracy, we want to have the ingredients of democracy in place. And the ingredients include the right of citizens to assemble and protest lawfully and in peace. It includes sanctity of the electoral process, independence of the judiciary, independence of the legislative arm of government the rule of law. All these things are missing. And if they are missing in Nigeria, then we can never say we are practicing democracy. And if we are not practicing democracy, in vain do we hope to get the dividends of democracy. Okay. Um, Mr. Johnson, uh, sorry, we, we lost your audio for a while there. That's why uh, we couldn't continue with what you were saying. Uh, but instead of going back there, we'd like to go forward and talk about this um, a protest that is going on. Even the FCT minister that was talking tough is now saying that we are ready to dialogue. And some people in the, in the presidency are saying that uh, the, the, the government is ready to dialogue, even though some of us are still not comfortable when they apportion blames to the opposition only, uh, seeming as if it is only the opposition feeling the bite that is making people go on the streets. But if this dialogue uh, comes up. What are some of the things that you would like to be addressed? What are some of the things you expect the presidency or the government to address? First and foremost, the government needs to put this out in order. There are a lot of um, uncoordinated approach 
in terms of the government response to to either criticism of of its policies, whether internally or externally, and then um, uh, you look at how the government reacted to when Senator Nungi criticized the budgeting process, and you look at how the government reacted to when Senator Ndume raised and raised the flag with respect to the situation of things in the country. <clears throat> Uh, it seems as if the level of tolerance of this government to criticism is not high. The beauty of democracy is that there will be dissenting voice. It's about consenting and dissenting voice. Majority will have their way and the minority will have, will have their say. And just like you pointed out, we have seen a clear statement, a threatening statement on the part of the actors and players of government, particularly the minister, the minister of, 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 of federal capital territory, um, the spokesperson, um, to, 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 to the president and then all, all other um, unsolicited spokesperson of, of the president as I do football like was pointed out then on Mokri um, and, um, and and um, and the likes Daniel Buala and the likes of them uh, speaking on behalf of the government with respect to the citizen not having the right to protest so I think that's the first that's the first approach because as far as I'm concerned I think it is the reckless statement on the, on the part of all un, unappointed spokesperson of this government that has aggravated this issue, that has heightened the tension concerning, concerning the protest. The second aspect of it is, is for government to address some of the issues that have been raised. What will have stopped the president from giving, from giving a national address, appealing and speaking to Nigerians that, well, we have heard your voices, we have listened to you, and will do the needful. Just give us time, give us patience. The president had time to invite traditional rulers to. He had time to invite traditional rulers to Asuro. Invited governors to Asuro to dialogue with them. Invited invited governors um, to Asuro to dialogue. These are not the actors that are actually calling for protest. And they have time for him to invite those that are calling for those protests to, 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 to dialogue with them. Rather, he was dialoguing with people that are part and parcel of the establishment and see where it has, see where it has, it has, it has led us to. So I think these are some of the issues that needs to be addressed with respect to dealing with dissent. Dissent is a core component part of democracy. There will always be dissenting voices. There is no way you can do away with dissenting voices. All of us cannot sleep and put our head together in one place. It's about how you manage issues. And if you don't manage issues, all attended issues lead to conflict. Conflict not resolved leads to crisis. Now, the, the government did not manage the issue very well, and the issue has led to conflict, which has led to untold crisis that the consequences, I'm not too sure we are going to recover from it in the next six months or the next nine months. Some, some families have been left with the lifelong damage because They've lost their breadwinner, they've lost their son, they've lost their daughter, um, both on the part of the protesters and the part of those that are employed by the government. There, there was a case of a policeman set established in, 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 in one of the northern, northern states. These are, these are uncalled for, these are avoidable, and these are first major that the government could have prevented with just dialogue and reasoning with people. We are, uh, look at look at what the Senate president, look at the reckless statement made by the Senate president um, concerning 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 the, the, the protest. It's it's it's, it's just it's just um, uh, unbelievable that you have elected officials who are so insensitive to, to, to the plights and the needs of the citizenry and at the end of the day to be playing playing the ostrich, playing the opposition. Look. Without protest, would there be this democracy? Without that, there would protest. Would there be this fourth report? There will be this fourth report. Don't also forget that APC as a party came as a result of the 2012 protest. APC was formed in 2013. It was a coalition of same Nigerian group led by Tunde Bakari and the likes of them plus ACA that led to the formation the, the 2012, the January 2012 protest on Fuel I led to the formation of APC in 2013. Now, if they could come into existence as a result of protest, 
and as the plea was provided for them to protest them, why are they denying people from having protest? And let me quickly add this so that I can allow my colleague to have his input. He spoke about the, the, the mobilization of the security agents. <clears throat> there's nowhere anywhere in the world, there's nowhere anywhere in the world that you have mass protests that does not lead to riots at the end of the day. Whether it's in America, whether it's in Great Britain, whether anywhere you have protest that it does not lead to. Look at what quote unquote the Americans, particularly the Democratic Party, called the summer of love in 2020, the Floyd, um, the George Floyd protest. Look at what it led to. One drug destruction of property, looting, and the rest of me. What government is really do is to ensure that protest does not happen. Whatever is within their means, they dialogue with the actors and the players to prevent it. Because once you allow protest to happen, all scrupulous element will tap into it. It's, it's clear. I can tell you of personal experience why I did not do union in school. In 1991 or 1992, I recall, it was on the foil crisis. We went, we went on protest. The federal capital territory was still in Lagos. We went, we are all university students, uni lax students. We went on protest over that, and we seized more than 500 vehicles belonging to the federal government on Third Mainland Bridge. Third Mainland Bridge was just open, and the federal capital territory was in Lagos. We seized more than 50 Jubilee buses by Lagos state government. That was... Um, um, Jubilee, but yes, by our federal administration. You know what happened to those buses when we got to campus? Students were vandalizing it. And I look at, is this what I went out for? Is this what I believe in? And that's why I didn't play, you know, on campus. Because I, I was shocked that at our level of intelligence, at our level of exposure and sophistication, we say we are fighting for a cause with resort to vandalization, stealing and looting of property. And so, it's, it's very clear if you are, if, 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 if you are not been involved in this thing that you know that it will degenerate to this level. Okay, Mr. Agule, um, the, the government on the one hand is saying that uh, they have done a lot of things and the questions or the requests of the people who are protesting have been answered already in the things that they are doing. Uh, they have... Uh, uh, made they have given designated centers for people to get rice for a cheap price the tariff on essential foods uh, has been removed and uh, so many things are being addressed but how would you read uh, or how would you uh, what would your comment be on the response of government to the request of the people i'm not talking about how they spoke to nigerians but i'm talking about the things that they are doing to show that they are proactive how would you describe those? I, I, I hear government people, uh, spokesmen for government and those who support government, continue to make this statement that it will take time for the policies of the current government to start yielding results. And I hear this always and I ask myself, what are the policies that these people are talking about which they want us to be patient and the results are going to come very soon? Because if you look at uh, the first policy, fuel subsidy is gone. This policy was announced on the first day in office of Mr. President. You say fuel subsidy is gone, and that jumped fuel price from about 180 to 700 plus that we're buying now. If we are patient for the next three years to the first tenure of this government, how is that policy going to bring results to Nigerians. The only way that policy can bring results to Nigerians is if there was a follow-up policy. So having removed fuel subsidy, you then need to deal with refineries. If you get to refineries, and as we speak today, one or two of the refineries were working, then Nigerians can have hope that in, 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 in a matter, it's only a matter of time. All the four refineries will be working, we are refining locally. Therefore, the policy is going to mature and give us some dividends. But the government hasn't done anything about the refineries. The refineries are still in the hands of the NMPC. The management of the NMPC is still intact. The same management that could refine a barrel, a single barrel of crude oil for so many years. So that is number one. Number two,
government say uh, electricity tariff has been removed. Please, I would like them to explain how we are going to be patient with the electricity tariff being removed and it will yield us dividends in due course. The only way for dividends in electricity to be yielded is if government followed up that electricity tariff remover policy with a policy of changing the game in the electricity sector. The transmission company in the hands of government is wasted, bringing us down to 3,000 megawatts. The discourse was sold to government people is pinning down us, pinning us down to 3,000 megawatts. If government followed electricity subsidy remover with changing the structure in the transmission company, changing the discourse, we will be hopeful that in due course, there will be plenty of electricity supply and the prices will come down. Let us look at the one of uh, interest rates. The central bank keeps hiking interest rate. If we are patient now with interest rates at 26.75 percent for the next three years, how is that going to bring in a soccer to us? I can't see any soccer. So the only way that that kind of policy will bring soccer is if government is now looking for ways to aid production, production of goods and services in Nigeria, such that Nigerians we no longer now have to be paying high prices because of the because of the uh, transfer of high interest rates into prices of goods and services i can go on and on so all the policies that this government have executed so far is to bring hardship we haven't seen any policy that is going to reduce the hardship with time so Government officials that keep saying we should be patient, we should be patient. How long are we going to be patient with a few price at 700? How long are we going to be patient with uh, electricity subsidy remover? How long are we going to be patient with uh, high interest rate? How long are we going to be patient with the, 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 the insecurity that is preventing the production of food? Government isn't doing anything. I have seen no policy that we are going to be patient with. If they have, let them put it on the table. Mm. Mr. Jire Johnson, do you also think uh, along the lines of Mr. Nika Gule, uh, you are in the education sector apart from anything else, and then we see that uh, there are student loans that government has given uh, to students, even though we still see some institutions are not able to access these loans. And then yesterday we saw on the headlines that the students might need to pay up to 80,000 naira as uh, electricity tariff in schools to be able to have light in school and all that. So I, I don't know if you are also uh, of the same school of thought with uh, Nika Gule that the policies of this government are not thing to write home about. Yeah, let's just go into that education we should talk about. It tells you how sensitive, how ungrateful, and all those that are in government, they have to the Nigerian people. One, you are beneficiaries of scholarship and all forms of subsidy concerning education. When they were young, um, they, they had the best of resources, facilities, and infrastructure while they were in school. In actual sense, Nigerian school, for most of them, Nigerian school, I, I, I was told, and, and I've done my research concerning that, that is only those that are not brilliant enough um, that sought admission abroad in the, in the 60s, in the late 60s, and in the early 70s, and the late 80s. Because we have foreign nationals coming to teach in Nigeria, or from all over the world. Our, our, our institutions were the best in, in, in the world, were, were one of the best in the world in terms of faculty, in terms of resources. All you need to do is just to take a trip. Take a trip to the University of Nigeria, Suka, University of Lagos, University of Ibadan, Obafemi Aulo University, um, Amadou Bolo University in Zaharia. And you take a trip to these institutions and look at the critical infrastructure they have within this period, 1974 to 1980. And compare the infrastructure they, they had after that, which was the golden era of our oil money. And then you look at what students were enjoying then, and who are those students then? 
and compare it to what the students are enjoying now, and compare to the resources they are requiring parents to pay for students now, you understand that they are just taking us for granted. They don't really care. They don't really care about us. They give us something with their right hand, and they take it back with their two left hands. And that's what this government and successive government have done, have done in Nigeria. As far as I'm concerned, I'm totally against the removal of education subsidy. I'm totally against the government um, coming up with student with student loans uh, because in terms of you know you know before we got that being passed and um, it was the first one that was passed was rejected by the nigerian people before they passed and the second one even they are telling us that there is going to be an amendment to the one they, 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 they passed i think this government is in glory that's just my my my, my conclusion this government does not think through its policies before they roll out their policy. They are always, they are in a hurry to, 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 to put their footprints on, 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 the, on the landmark of, of the Nigerian nation. They want to achieve so much, yet uh, they, they, they have different convergent policies conflicting, conflicting with, with, with one another. So the education, the, 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 the education, uh, the student loan, uh, apart from the student loan, okay, what have they done concerning the educational sector? Okay, they have given the student loan. What the money they've saved in terms of the subsidy they removed from education, have they invested it back to to to, to this institution? What are the infrastructure that this this government has put in place in the last one year in those institutions? You can take a trip to this institution and see what they've done in the last one year since they've removed. Okay. This particular, um, this particular um, subsidy for education, and then bringing in uh, the student loan that student student can can assess can assess the loan. So, All right. <laughs> okay, uh, well, from, I from guess long time we just see that this government has just imposed on two hardship on Nigerians, and they are insensitive to the price of every Nigerian. Well, it's unfortunate. Um, they hit the ground running, but it's unfortunate that they may have hit the ground running in the opposite direction. Uh, progress is somewhere and they are going the opposite way. It's unfortunate, but uh, we hope that uh, uh, there will be light because right now a lot of Nigerians are not seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. There's no tunnel even. We are just there in a, in a hole. Uh, but um, we'd like to thank you. This is uh, how much we can go uh, at this moment. Mr. Jide Johnson, thank you so much for coming on the show. And also, yeah, Mr. Nick Agule as well. Thank you so much. Uh, you can now go to sleep, Mr. Agule. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, and uh, good morning to our viewers. Mm, yeah. Okay, so we'll be talking with Mr. Nick Agule and uh, Jide Johnson, both uh, public affairs analysts. Nick was talking to us from uh, uh, the United States of America, and uh, Mr. Jide Johnson from here in Lagos. We'll take a short break, and when we return, we'll be joined by some other analysts that will be looking at the protests and everything else. And also, we hope to be joined by our correspondents from all around the country that will be giving us situation reports where they are. Stay with us.